Tonight, civilians under fire in Ukraine, hours after an attack on a critical Russian bridge. Homes destroyed and people terrorized by missile strikes. It was so scary. We're on the ground in the destruction. The blast was so powerful that not only did it level homes, but it tossed around vehicles. Reaction at the rink after a major resignation at Hockey Canada. I think they should just get rid of the whole thing. And a crushing collapse with the Blue Jays, but it's far from a first for some sports fans. Another Toronto team can't get it done. This is The National with Ian Hennemansing. There are reports tonight the Ukrainian city of Zaporizhia has been hit again by missile strikes. CBC News is in that city where people are already reeling from another round of attacks. They hit just hours after this explosion yesterday on the Kerch Bridge, both a critical link between Crimea and Russia and a potent symbol of Russia's conquest of that Ukrainian territory, shattered and in flames. Russia says three died in that blast. Vladimir Putin breaking his silence tonight about the attack. Putin called it a terrorist act carried out by Ukraine against Russian civilian infrastructure. Just hours before that statement, Russian missile strikes damaged dozens of homes in the Ukrainian city of Zaporizhia. The bodies still being counted, the images harrowing. Briar Stewart is there on the ground. These were once homes. Now it's hard to make sense of the ash-colored rubble. This man doesn't know what happened to his girlfriend, so he paces around what's left of the house in desperation. They lived in these two rooms, he said. Across the street, this woman woke up to the explosion and part of her ceiling fell on her. We came outside and tried to help our neighbors find people under the rubble, she said. I can't describe how we were all frantically running around and searching. It's unclear how many are dead. The blast was so powerful that not only did it level homes, but it tossed around vehicles. That car right there was thrown on top of the roof and crews pushed it down this morning. Neighbors, volunteers and cleanup crews work quickly to clear the rubble from the site. But three kilometers away, it's a much more precarious job. There were fears this apartment building could be on the edge of collapse, so crews worked cautiously. Throughout the night, they pulled out victims. And this morning, more grim discoveries. Despite the horror of it, some remain defiant. We will never forgive Russians. They will never frighten us. We will survive this, she said. This is the third deadly attack in Zaborizhia in 10 days. On Thursday, at least 19 people were killed when a missile slammed into this building. And the week before, three missiles hit a crowded checkpoint, killing 30. Last night, Nicole Prohotko hid in the bathroom with her boyfriend after the first explosion. It was so scary and I remember I was crying. She couldn't find her cat Sonia, but she appeared this morning, but was too frightened to come out from this corner. I am thinking more about people who were there in that house and I couldn't believe that some of them are not alive anymore. She believes her city was hit so badly overnight as payback for this, an attack on Russia's prize bridge to Crimea. President Vladimir Putin called the explosion an act of terrorism and blames Ukraine. Yuri Nikoneko believes Russia is targeting his city because it wants control of the entire region which it recently laid claim to. He vows that will never happen. No, Putin no, no, no. Putin should be punished a bit with this, he says, punished for everything he's doing to Ukraine. But it's his community that's suffering now. No amount of resolve can make up for what's been lost and what this city could still endure. Briar Stewart, CBC News, Zaporizhia.
And Russia has a new overall commander of its forces in Ukraine. General Sergei Surovikin led air operations during Russia's intervention in Syria. It's not clear who he's replacing. Since Russia's invasion began, at least eight generals have been fired or shuffled out. North Korea continues to raise concern tonight with its own missile launches. And with that backdrop, there was a rare visit from the Canadian government to the demilitarized zone between North and South Korea. Marina von Stackelberg now with the calls for peace. Foreign Affairs Minister Melanie Jolie walks through one of the most delicate border regions in the world, the space between South and North Korea, the demilitarized zone or DMZ, the only spot where the two countries have stood face to face since the end of the Korean War. Standing here today, I can see definitely a clear line between both countries, but also a clear line between freedom and oppression, it is indeed a symbol of peace, but also how much peace can be extremely fragile. Her visit comes amidst North Korea's barrage of weapons tests. There have been seven rounds of them in just the last two weeks, including one that flew over Japan for the first time in five years. You always have to take these things seriously, uh, but there is a certain predictability of this uh, of what happens on a Korean peninsula that's gone on for decades. And uh, of course, he, Kim Jong-un, is concerned about joint military exercises that have occurred over the past couple months. The North has called the recent two days of naval drills between the U.S. and South Korea provocative. It considers them a rehearsal for an invasion. While the West eyes are turned to what's happening in Ukraine, that that is another component to it is it's North Korea indicating that they are still here, um, that they are still a nuclear country that is to be taken seriously. This expert says Jolie's visit could be a move from Canada to increase diplomacy. For more than 70 years, Canada has been involved in and extremely committed to make sure that this part of the world is peaceful and stable. After visiting these conference rooms famous for peace negotiations, Jolie called on North Korea to return to dialogue and commit to nuclear disarmament. Marina von Stackelberg, CBC News, Ottawa. Under another authoritarian regime, the cries of revolt are getting louder. Protests continue across Iran in the face of a deadly crackdown by security forces. Katie Simpson shows us a brazen act of defiance this weekend. The Iranian state broadcaster's evening news was suddenly interrupted. <laughs> Hackers managed to air an image of Iran's supreme leader with a target on his head, along with messages of join us and rise up. While it only lasted 10 seconds, it panicked authorities. Everybody involved in that news bulletin was interrogated. They were kept in a room for a couple of hours before they were allowed to go home. Their phones had been confiscated because it seems that it was an inside job. The violent crackdown by security forces has not stopped nationwide anti-government protests and acts of defiance. Young women chanted, get lost, at Iranian President Ibrahim Raisi as he visited their university in Tehran. And unverified video, blurred to protect identities, allegedly shows school kids protesting. Some reportedly have been arrested. It's unprecedented to have a protest that is so unified in its voice that it's diverse, it's geographically diverse throughout the country, and it's the fourth week. We have never had a protest that has lasted this long since the revolution. Weeks of demonstrations began after the burial of Masa Amini, a 22-year-old woman who died in the custody of Iran's morality police, arrested for allegedly failing to cover her hair properly. One human rights organization says at least 185 people have been killed in the unrest, including 19 children. The movement has inspired demonstrations all around the world, including several over the weekend in cities across Canada. It's, it's not a protest anymore. It's definitely a revolution. Even though it's really sad, it's upsetting, it's stressful, but we are all happy that it, this is finally happening. These kinds of demonstrations are expected to continue for as long as the protests continue in Iran where there are no signs either side is willing to back down. Katie Simpson, CBC News, Washington.
Turning now to another issue on the minds of many Canadians tonight, the scandal gripping Hockey Canada and the very future of the organization. As Susanna De Silva shows us, after a high-profile resignation, some members of the hockey community hope this is the beginning of major change. Along with talk of great plays, there's also talk about Hockey Canada's future at local rinks right now. I think a new name, a whole new regime, everything, right? I think they should just get rid of the whole thing altogether, really. It's definitely going to end up having to be a mentality and a change, and I think that comes with uh, more than just one person. He's talking about Interim Hockey Canada Board Chair Andrea Skinner. She resigned this weekend after controversial testimony. Our board, frankly, does not share the view that senior leadership should be replaced on... Skinner was speaking at a parliamentary committee meeting over Hockey Canada's handling of sexual assault allegations and funds used to settle them. To scapegoat hockey as a centerpiece for toxic culture is, in my opinion, counterproductive. A view not shared by many. That's just another example of, of, of the old guard thinking that they own our game and they control everything that happens in our sport. Former NHLer Akeem Aliou says Skinner's resignation barely begins to deal with the changes needed. And until we can get new blood, um, some innovative thinking, and just a new perspective of where the game should go and just to get with the times of what's going on in 2022, we're not going to be able to see any tangible change. This is now the second board chair they've lost in two months, and the executive leadership team remains intact. There are renewed calls for President and CEO Scott Smith, who took over in July, but has been a leader in the organization in different capacities for decades, to testify again before the House of Commons Committee, as sponsors have fled and local hockey organizations examine next steps. We have to acknowledge, though, that there has been an undercurrent that has existed in the dark corners of our sport. The entire country is just now finally talking about the unspoken. Susie, Hockey Canada was supposed to elect a new board next month, but that's changed. Yes, that has now been delayed until December 17th, and that's to allow the review of a report by the retired Supreme Court Justice Thomas Cromwell. He's looking into the governance structure of Hockey Canada, and that will allow them to potentially implement any changes he might recommend. Meanwhile, pressure is mounting on the organization as the premiers of New Brunswick and Nova Scotia say they want to see significant changes before they host the next World Junior Tournament. Ian? Thanks, Susie. And in the NHL tonight, the Tampa Bay Lightning is suspending one of its players in the wake of sexual assault allegations. They involved defenseman Ian Cole, and they were made on social media by a woman who says he abused her when she was a minor. The Lightning says it's cooperating with the league on an investigation and suspending Cole until they can gather more details. In a statement tonight, Cole says he completely denies the allegations and looks forward to clearing his name. Canadian soccer superstar Alfonso Davies is sidelined with a bruise on his skull. This after being kicked in the head during a match in Germany on the weekend. An opposing player went for the ball with his foot while Davies went in with his head. The two collided. He was helped off the field and didn't return. His team, Bayern Munich, says tests revealed the bruise. Davies sent a message to fans. I just want to say thank you, everyone, for the nice messages. And I'm looking forward to being back on the pitch soon. No timeline yet for that. And this, of course, of particular concern to Canadian soccer fans because Canada's first World Cup appearance in 36 years begins in a month. And Davies is expected to play a major part. If you're a Blue Jays fan, this may have been a subdued Sunday. The team hoped to be celebrating a wildcard series win tonight, or at least having played today. But as Greg Ross shows us, a roller coaster game two stopped that dream in its tracks. A walk in the park. Not exactly what these Blue Jays fans thought this day would hold. I thought, good, we got a game on Sunday. That's what Robin and Christine Williams were thinking while watching the Blue Jays do this. Swing and a drive again, Teoscar has done it again. The Jays were facing elimination in game two of their wild card series against Seattle. At one point, Toronto was leading eight to one. That's when the Williams started making plans to get tickets for game three. They weren't the only fans looking ahead. It was a wrap. It was over. I mean, it was a celebratory mood. Everyone's on their feet. Arash Madani covers the Blue Jays for Rogers Sportsnet. He says the celebration at Rogers Center was short lived. Fly ball, deep left field. The Mariners started to claw their way back, eventually taking the lead and silencing the crowd. You could hear a pin drop in that building. 
The Mariners hung on to beat the Jays 10 to 9, sending the 47,000 plus fans who were here at the Rogers Center home disappointed. Another Toronto team can't get it done. This type of misery is nothing new to Williams, also a long suffering Leafs fan. He watched them blow a 4 to 1 lead at the end of game 7 in the 2013 Stanley Cup playoffs. Then also blow a three games to one series lead in the 2021 playoffs against the Montreal Canadiens. It absolutely compares the meltdowns the Leafs have had. 4-1, game seven, third period, eight to one, eight to one. Adding insult to injury now, all of those online memes and the taunts from rival fans. My family in Montreal, they don't, they're, <laughs> they're relentless, yeah. And the comments are really, really hard. That's probably them calling right now. Probably them saying, <laughs> what's going on? Williams is trying to look on the bright side. He says there's still hope for the Blue Jays. Maybe they just weren't ready to take the next step. Greg Ross, CBC like News, right Toronto. Yeah, I thought they did all the... In Atlanta, Canada, thousands are facing a Thanksgiving without power in the wake of Fiona. In Nova Scotia, about 400 customers still in the dark. On Prince Edward Island, about 4,700 still waiting for electricity to be restored. This is more than two weeks after the storm. And it means turkey dinner was likely a challenge for a lot of islanders. Perfect. So in the small community of Georgetown, volunteers have been busy preparing a meal for anyone in the community who needs one. When they uh, booked their spots, they really expressed their, their gratitude for the opportunity to, <laughs> to sit in a well-lit place with a hot meal and, and also just to be together. More than 100 signed up for the Georgetown feast. And in Charlottetown, the Salvation Army is ready to serve up turkey too. We've encountered lots of people who've lost almost all their food. And so there's a lot of people that may not be able to afford a turkey. When so many have lost so much, these islanders are embodying the spirit of Thanksgiving. And it's not just in Atlantic Canada. There are efforts across this country to make sure people are being fed this Thanksgiving. Sky high food prices mean the demand for help is up. But as Ithil Musa shows us, they're also making it more difficult for some organizations to keep up with the demand. Members of Toronto's African Food Basket are prepping. The nonprofit organization provides the city's African, Caribbean, and Black communities in need with free, culturally relevant food baskets. And this Thanksgiving, they'll be giving away hundreds. What you'll see in our baskets are Caribbean sweet potatoes, edos, cassava. The organization says Black Torontonians are three and a half times more likely to be food insecure. The pandemic only made things worse. Then food prices shot up. It's not just in inflation, it's also shipping and how things come into the country. Um, so typically where we would have been putting, let's say, uh, four pieces of plant in a box, we might have to reduce that to three or two just because of the prices that are going up. Well, so for Thanksgiving, like I said... Elena in Toronto be... says she relies on food banks to get by, and this Thanksgiving will be no different. But she says food banks are struggling to meet the demand. They have less, and there is more people coming, so they have to stretch that. At Vancouver's Union Gospel Mission, they're also dealing with a similar challenge, less and less money. You, you can see in 2020, it was uh, 569 for the turkey breasts or whatever. And 2021, you can see it jumped up to 681. Kitchen manager Randy Sparks says he's now paying $7.99 a pound for turkey breast. Skyrocketing costs have led to creative measures to save even just a little bit. Making sure that we show our volunteers when they come in to cut closer to the celery stock and don't take off too much. And, you know, little cost cutting things like that, they really add up when you talk about the numbers and the bulk that we do here. Spark says he's already anticipating the same challenges and the same level of need at Christmas. Idil Musa, CBC News, Toronto. Blue Jays fans may be crushed, but hey, hockey's just getting underway, and it's a fresh start for at least one Stanley Cup winner. It's going to be Nazem Kadri. Nazem Kadri speaks with me about diversity in hockey and that age-old question. Is, I'm going to ask you this awkward question. When are the Leafs going to win the Cup? <laughs> Plus the discovery of an underwater forest in the Arctic. We're seeing massive, massive, massive kelp. Why they're a symbol of a changing climate and... Hey, 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 hey. 
Musicians in Winnipeg get their moment in the Buble spotlight. How would you like to, to sing on stage with Michael Buble? We're back in two. The waters of the Arctic are the front lines of climate change, warming faster than in many other parts of the world. The extreme conditions make tracking the impact of that change on the ecosystem difficult. Jalen Bernstein follows scientists who, with the help of Inuit experts, found a biological treasure trove. In bitterly cold northern waters, a scientist hunts for an underwater forest, kelp specifically. With ocean warming and climate change, we know things are going to change. And so we need baseline information about what's here now so that we can detect change in the future. All that information is hidden in these waters in Cambridge Bay off the coast of Victoria Island in Nunavut. In the Arctic, it's extra challenging because you have to get into water that can be zero degrees Celsius. So it's really, you know, it's not for everybody. Inuk expert John Lyle guided the team to good fishing spots. He too is learning more about where kelp is hiding below, providing food and shelter for marine life. I learn what they see and they tell me, and then I find a new spot for diving. It's been decades since kelp was studied in this region. The most recent samples collected by botanist RKS Lee in the 1960s and 70s. So these scientists weren't quite sure what they'd find when they ventured out. But then, the mother load. We're seeing massive, massive, massive kelp, more than six feet tall. I think they look like they're more than eight feet tall. A true kelp forest in the Western Arctic, a hot spot for biodiversity that may offer clues about the impacts of climate change. It's this super huge like discovery that we found this on our almost our last day. Well done, divers. As the Arctic warms nearly four times faster than the rest of the world, scientists hope to learn more about which kelp species will adapt to warmer waters and what that means for the larger food chain. There's a, a complete forest living there, and we never realize how much these forests are connecting to us. It's not because you live in Montreal or Ottawa, then you're not connected to the ocean. The ocean is always connected to you. Amanda Savoie plans to return regularly to monitor this crucial habitat and the life it supports. Jayla Bernstein, CBC News, Montreal. A new NHL season is about to begin, and among the changes, Nazem Kadri is a Calgary Flame. This less than four months after winning the Stanley Cup with Colorado. <laughs> but that moment of glory came just weeks after Kadri was the target of hate. I refuse to, to let those people impact my career and how I feel about myself. His thoughts on diversity in hockey and what it takes to win, next. A special moment for Canadian Nazem Kadri as he celebrated on the ice with his Colorado Avalanche teammates in June. It has been a career filled with challenges for the NHL star who has faced adversity both on and off the ice. There have been those controversial penalties, injuries and off-ice racist insults directed at his Islamic faith. He has persevered and on Thursday he makes his regular season debut with his new team, the Calgary Flames. I recently chatted with Kadri and got a chance to play a little hockey, sort of, with an NHL pro. All right, here we go. Yeah. Oh, look at that, yeah. give him a breakaway right off the start. <laughs> oh, big save. That's, oh. Not, that's not fair, what a save. Okay, you can play defense or what? Is this what they say about Kadri? Uh, play defense? <laughs> oh. Okay, we'll end it Delay there. Game. That's All a right. power play for me. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. From the London Knights of the Ontario Hockey League, Nazem Kadri. There's a stereotype that not many uh, of my community play hockey, and I think that's, uh, that's the wrong stereotype. Here comes Kadri! So you're doing something that I think a lot of NHL players are reluctant to do, and that is you've signed with a Canadian team, huge expectations. You probably won't be able to go to the supermarket again for the next seven <laughs> years without being recognized. Why did you decide to go to Calgary? 
Um, yeah, of course. I mean, I'm a Canadian boy, so you know, I love the country of Canada, and it's always been a, a pleasure to live here. So that was, uh, you know, makes it easier for my family to come out and travel. And, and of course, the direction of the team on the ice is, mm -hmm. a, is a big draw for me. So, you know, I, I always appreciate a, a, you know, a strong, passionate fan base, you know, based on my history. I've been there before. <laughs> I know what to expect. So uh, I'm looking forward to it. It's going to be Nazem Gadri who comes back from the broken thumb. You go in there as a Stanley Cup champion. That phrase sounds pretty good to you still. Amazing, amazing. And you got to bring the Stanley Cup here. We were in London, Ontario, where you grew up, where you played junior hockey. Uh, and among the places you took it was the mosque. And so we took some video that day. I just want to play you a nice. short excerpt. Here we go, all right. Okay, here we go. Just watch, you can watch this. It's a really special moment to see him bring it home, how he's inspired all the Muslim youth, even every single little Canadian boy, that if he can do it, they can all do it. For it to be at the mosque, I think it's never happened before, so it's a really good feeling, because then it feels like nothing is impossible. <laughs> I love that. What a fantastic day. And I mean, there's just so much joy in what we heard there. But I'm curious, for you, what was the day like? Uh, it was it was incredible. Even just watching that gives me uh, goosebumps. You know, I, I think uh, just any time you get the opportunity to be the first to, to do anything is mm -hmm. uh, is quite the honor and the privilege. And you know, just being there, uh, you know, firsthand and just seeing the crowd and a lot of it was uh, you know was younger kids and, and kind of the next generation and. Uh, you know, for me, uh, I think that's a big part is just, you know, that, that next generation coming up and just understanding that uh, hockey is such a great sport. And, you know, if, if you, you know, work hard and you dedicate yourself to it, you know, you can achieve the, the highest of achievements. So it's, uh, it was an absolute honor to, to get that done. So we heard from some young people who say they're not only impressed by you, but inspired by you. Mm -hmm. I'll bet you in 10 or 15 years, there'll be some NHL players who will say that you were their inspiration. But what about for you? Who, who blazed the trail for you? Where did you get your inspiration from? Um, no, nobody really that I could, you know, specifically identify with. And, you know, I think that was, uh, you know, it wasn't, wasn't a problem, but I always felt, you know, I didn't really think anything of it when I was younger. But growing up, I kind of always started to ask more questions and just kind of wonder. And, uh, you know, I think it's great just, you know, kind of breaking that barrier and, and just... Uh, you know, having hockey become a, a more diverse uh, sport just because, you know, I feel like there's a lot of um, wasted talent out there that might not, uh, you know, that might make it to that next level or might be in the next superstar that, you know, end up, uh, you know, giving up for, for various reasons. So uh, just to hear that I've been an uh, inspiration and, and uh, you know, it's, it's certainly motivating for me and uh, it's very exciting. Now, here we are in 2022, and, you know, I contrast all the joy in London, Ontario that day in late August with two months earlier. You guys in Colorado are playing St. Louis. You, you collide with the goaltender. Driving wide with a shot, loose puck. Down goes Bennington, puck swatted away. Kadri into him after the save. Bennington slow to get up. He doesn't appear to be okay here. But he got injured. Fans were mad. That's hockey. The part that isn't hockey, or at least shouldn't be hockey, is some of the reaction. And your wife mm. shared some of the social media posts that are so ugly, we can't, we have to blur out some of the words uh, on the air. Um, it was disgusting. Mm. I mean, how, how, how is it for you? Um, well, of course, I've kind of had some experience handling this in, in the past. You know, you just got to understand there's, there's some ignorant people out there, and, and they shouldn't uh, have any sort of influence on your confidence or, or who you are or your character. And, uh, you know, I think that's what I've been, been good at. Um, you know, it's, it's been hard at times and, um, you know, but I refuse to, to let those people impact my career and how I feel about myself and other people. There's some very ignorant, you know, uneducated people out there that know nothing about um, culture. One of the nice things was the, the huge support you got immediately. You know, I, I feel like maybe 25 years ago, I don't know, but maybe some people would say, just suck it up, you know, that's just mm -hmm. life. This time around, a lot of people were saying, that's not acceptable, and we stand w with NASM. How was the league during all of this? Did you get support from the NHL? Um, I, I don't believe, if, I think maybe a statement was made or, or something, but I mean, um, you know, I know they obviously don't condone that type of behavior, nor should they. You know, in terms of the home city, you know, the Denver mm -hmm. crowd, I was in Colorado and, 
you know, I came home and I just, I remember after that game vividly, uh, just, you know, receiving a super welcoming welcome home from our mm. home crowd. It was really one of the most amazing things I've ever experienced wow. in the game of hockey during a playoff game in the midst of all this competition. You managed to respond, as you probably often do, on the ice, three goals in the next game. Uh, you scored a lot of big goals last year, including in, the over, in an overtime in the finals. Uh, but some people felt that maybe there were too many men on the ice. Pretty simple. The game-winning goal was scored with too many abs on the ice. You decided to, uh, to roll with that. Here's a picture of you at the Stanley Cup <laughs> celebration wearing a yep, t-shirt. It's a great and, Sally. <laughs> and we've got, absolutely, and we've got a copy of the t-shirt here. And so you kind of turn that into mm -hmm. a, a positive, too many men, yeah, uh, yeah. both for that moment, but also for your foundation. Tell mm -hmm. us about that. You know, there was all, all this controversy about what, ha what had happened. and. You know, obviously it's, you know, their kind of theories, whatever, you know, transpired during the goal was, uh, you know, obviously there's officials out there and um, and the fluidity of the game just kind of happens. But, yeah, I ended up just trying to have some fun with it. And uh, uh, all proceeds went to the Nazem Kadri Foundation. And uh, we ended up, you know, I think doing over $200,000 wow. in sales. And, uh, you know, all for, for great, great reasons. Yeah, the fans showing me love and just trying to support and uh, and donate, which is something I uh, you know I, I was I was almost overwhelmed with. So mm -hmm. it was very cool. And in terms of hockey culture, a lot of people have been questioning it for a lot of reasons. I want to ask you specifically in terms of the way that people of color um, are are dealt with uh, in terms of hockey culture. You obviously love the sport and mm -hmm. you've done really well at it. And you talk about all the support that you get. How would you describe for people what the hockey culture is in in Canada? I think it's like a tight knit community. It's almost like a family, really. Uh, you know, all all of my teammates that I've had. You know, I can't really picture or you know off the top of my head think about any bad ones. You know, I've had all great experiences. You know, I think it's taught me a lot of great lessons. And you know, my favorite part of it is just you know that you know social aspect too. Is just getting mm -hmm. in the dressing room and, and being in a room full of guys, being all on the same team, pulling on the same rope. I think it's. Uh, you know, you find a lot of you find a lot about yourself in those you know crucial crucial moments. Can I finish with an awkward question? Well, I will anyway. Sure. I'm going to ask you this awkward question: When are the Leafs going to win the cup? <laughs> That's for other people to answer, not me. <laughs> <laughs> you got a chance to play for the Leafs. Is there still a warm? And, and of course, you left under mm -hmm. you know like uh, it must have been difficult to leave the team. Is there still a, a warm spot in your heart for them? Of course, of course. I still got a lot of friends on that team and, you know, ones that I talk to, you know, pretty regularly. I obviously live in Toronto, so I think uh, the city is always going to hold a special place in my heart. And I just, you know, I had so much pride in, you know, playing for that team and wearing that jersey. So that's uh, something that's never going to change. And uh, it's always going to be a part of me and my career and part of who I am. And, uh, you know, of course, I just, I wish him nothing but the best. But now it's all about Calgary. <laughs> yeah, but I'd rather win. <laughs> All right, thank you very much. No problem. You know, I've watched that interview a few times as we put it together, and, and if you're interested, it's worth looking at it a second time because he's very careful about what he says when he's critical of, I think, the NHL and their response to the attacks, the racist attacks he got, and on the other hand, his support for all the teammates he's had over the years. It's interesting the second time through. We'll post it online. Next on The National, a grieving grandmother takes action against gang violence. Nobody deserves to be killed in a violent manner by these gangs that are probably all hooked on drugs. Turning a tragedy into a call for action. And the school bus goes electric, but it comes at a cost. Stay with us. In Regina tonight, a grandmother is determined to make sure her 14-year-old grandson didn't die in vain. He was killed earlier this year. Three other teens are now charged with murder. As Nick Purden shows us, she's channeling her grief into action. Well, this is where my grandson lay. This truck is in the way, but he was laying in this area. He got shot in the chest and in the back of the head like this through the head and he died instantly, they said. 
he bled out right here. What's it make you think about? I wish I could have been there. Yeah, I just wish I would have been able to hold him. Brenda Longman Yager's grandson, Jake, was just 14 when he died three months ago. Or protect him or take the bullet for him, you know. Three young offenders have been charged with first degree murder. But Jake Longman's death points to a bigger problem in Saskatchewan. Indigenous people here are 13 times more likely to die by homicide than non-Indigenous people. Can a grandmother help change a statistic like that? My Jake was quite a sweetheart. He was so into learning new things. He was a sports fanatic, and he was always trying to help other people. He had a big heart. He had a heart of gold, this kid. The police come. They tell you what happened to your grandson. What, do you, what did you do? I thought to myself, okay, I can either go crazy and try to get revenge and become these people. I don't know I'm, what I was thinking. I wanted to be a one-woman gang. I don't know. But I thought, no, I got to do something positive for my grandson. Okay, uh, I just want to thank everybody for coming. Just weeks after Jake's murder, Brenda started what she calls a grandmother's group to try to stop the violence in Regina. Um, okay, um, the last meeting we talked about our long-term treatment facility due to the fact that the short-term facilities that are crowded, overcrowded, and they have a long wait list. Brenda believes drug addictions are the root of the problem. And since Jake's death, she's had a dream to get a new treatment center built. And Brenda already has one city councillor, Tarina Shaw, on board. And taking, taking this horrible experience, Brenda, that you went through with your grandson being killed, and having something good come out of it, I mean, there's no more, we're all fighting for that. I've been pushing for this. Brenda has also managed to get Regina's chief of police, Evan Bray, involved. You know, we do our job as police to try and limit the drugs coming in the community. But really what you're talking about here, Brenda, with your team is finding a way to help people get healthy. I, I applaud the work that your team is doing on, on trying to stress the need for a treatment facility in our community. Getting the committee together, getting the police involved, getting the city council involved, getting the province involved, that's the way we're going to make this difference for you, Brenda. Mm -hmm. yeah. Your group is truly a grassroots community group mm -hmm. of loving family members that have had enough. Um, Watching Brenda, I can't help wonder about the power of a grandmother with nothing else to lose. My little Jakey. I feel like my grandson is with me, cheering me on. Most days uh, I cry in the mornings and then I get over it, I go on. Evenings, yeah. You cry, then you get to work. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I pull up my granny pants and I say, okay, let's do this. Let's see what we can achieve today. Brenda's biggest goal is to try to get rid of the violence in her community. And she says she won't be quiet about it any longer, even if it's hard to talk about. Nobody deserves to be killed in a violent manner by these gangs that are probably all hooked on drugs. Do you worry about your safety talking like this? No. No, I'm old. I live my life. You know, I... If I'm not safe, I'm, I don't care. You know, what, what more can they do to hurt me? And I'm not afraid of any of them. The spot where Jake Longman was gunned down is returned to being a parking lot. You'd never even know what happened here. I'd like to put some uh, kind of memorial just to remember him by on the fence there, but, um, I'm, I'm sure it'll get vandalized by the gang members in this area because they, they all live in this area. What do you want people to know about your grandson and what happened to him? I don't want my son, my grandson's life to, you know, his murder to be in vain. 
You know, and I, 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 and I need help stopping this violence. This place has to be cleaned up. We have other little children living here that need a safe place. They have to be able to walk down the street without being shot at. Nick Purden, CBC News, Regina. Coming up next on The National, a look at how some schools are making changes to go green. But will new buses make a difference? Plus. A Michael Bublé concert with some local flavor. Being on stage with Michael Bublé and I said, uh, excuse me? <laughs> An opportunity almost too good to believe in our moment. This month, walk to school events across the country are trying to encourage students and parents to take the trek to school on foot. It's both healthier and greener, but if it's too far, there is, of course, the bus. And Deanna Sumanag Johnson shows us there are ways to make that greener, too. For this family, walking to and from school has been a cherished ritual for years. It is a great way to connect with other families. I have had parents come up to me and say, I used to drive my child, and it was just around the corner, and now we walk every single day. Instead of driving to school, which produces carbon dioxide, um, you are walking to school, which improves your mind and body. Fewer and fewer kids are walking to school in recent years. Environmental groups are encouraging parents to walk and cycle to school through events like Walktober, happening right now. The idea is just to get children and their families thinking about using active modes of transportation for the trip to school at the beginning of the year. But of course, not all families live close enough to walk. According to Transport Canada, about 2.2 million children travel to and from school every day on over 50,000 school buses, which run on diesel. One solution could be electric school buses. PEI will have 82 this fall, with a plan to eventually electrify all 322 buses in its fleet. Quebec is investing $18 million in subsidies for electric school buses. This one is our newest one. In British Columbia, Souk School District has bought six, about one-fifth of its total fleet. These are not cheap, each costing about $350,000, more than twice the price of a diesel one. We did receive uh, grants from the government, and of course we had to subsidize some of the costs. But in the long term, even though electric school buses are more expensive up front, in the long term there's less costs on, on diesel and gas, there's uh, less maintenance costs. It's quieter, the kids like it a lot better. Still, because of the price and the need for all stakeholders to sign off, the move towards all electric school buses across Canada will likely take years. In the meantime, the Thibairge family will stick with their favorite green option hitting the sidewalk, encouraging their neighbors to do the same. Deanna Sumanak Johnson, CBC News, Toronto. Justin Bieber is postponing the remainder of his world tour to focus on his health. Over the summer, Bieber had to halt the North American leg of the tour after being diagnosed with Ramsey-Hunt syndrome, a rare neurological disorder that paralyzed half his face temporarily. The remaining concerts will take place sometime next year. Michael Bublé's tour is in full swing, but those aren't his usual backup singers. They're local Winnipeg musicians who got a surprise opportunity this weekend. Each one of them received what seemed like a prank phone call just a week before the show. Next thing you know, they found themselves on the big stage next to Buble himself. Their moment in the spotlight is tonight's moment. Michael's agents gave me a call, um, told me what they were looking for, asked me to put together a group of singers. She said, how would you like to, to sing on stage with Michael Buble? And I said, uh, excuse me? And she said, uh, it's to sing with Michael Bublé. And I thought she was joking. And when that curtain went up and the lights were on us, uh, it was go time and it was, it was surreal. The curtain started coming up and we had to start singing. Um, and it was just really special that moment. I tried to just soak it in. 
It was one of those songs that just really lifts everybody up in the room. It makes you feel like a million bucks. It's goosebump inducing. It was flawless. It was flawless and his voice was flawless. My family uh, was in the audience and singing in front of people from Winnipeg was just a surreal experience in that song. Just like it really touched my heart. The experience itself was none like I've ever experienced before. That is fantastic. And, and you know what? Like, not that they're watching now, but people who do big tours should make that just a common thing where you contact a few local musicians and get them on there. Although I must say, thinking back to my friends when I was 15 or 16, they would watch that and then start making prank calls. So if you do get a call elsewhere on the Buble tour, be skeptical. Don't be rude, but be skeptical. That is The National for October the 9th. Have a good night. <laughs>